to welcome you to the fifth annual Tyler Astronomy Conference. <laughs> Wait, excuse me, what? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Wrong, wrong room. I'm happy to welcome you to the 2023 Library Lecture Series given by the Smith County Master Gardeners and sponsored by the Tyler Public Library. We're very happy to be here and we're very happy that you are here. We have an awesome series this year and I hope you come back because we do this once a month, third Friday of each month through May. So this is one of five. A very good, good one I might add, although I've never heard you talk. <laughs> Okay, one more time. If you have not signed in, you need to. Public or member, doesn't matter. That's the way you get your raffle ticket. One once, gone. We're very pleased today to have Dr. Andrew King. He's the fourth generation owner of King's Nursery. Andrew, as his father and grandfather before him, grew up on the nursery. But unlike them, Andrew knew from an early age that he wanted to be a horticulturist. Earning a BS in horticulture from Stephen F. Austin State University, Andrew became the first of four generations to be formally educated in horticulture. Not long thereafter, he earned an MS and a PhD, both in horticulture, from Texas A&M University <laughs> for five years. But after teaching horticulture at A&M for five years, he made his way back home to take his turn at operating King's Nursery. This comes from King's Nursery's website. I encourage you to go there and look at our story. It's very good, a very good read. Without further ado, Dr. Andrew King. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. What you make him up? Ah, the struggle. Sorry. Uh, it's good to see you. Glad you came. This would have been awkward if I'd have been here alone. <laughs> so that's not a problem today. Good heavens. Somebody said uh, it's a really good crowd today. And I said a number of things. First of all, uh, the first one, you guys are excited. You mentioned that, that uh, you guys have been uh, hungry for some horticulture. And uh, so it wouldn't matter if it had been me or Mickey Mouse or whoever show up. If you're talking about a fig or something, it would be just fine. And then, uh, I don't know, somebody said, you know, you got a good reputation. I said, well, we'll fix that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so we're thrilled to, uh, to be able to be here today. Uh, somebody was mentioning uh, that Last week, if you saw the Kingdom Fruit Conference, uh, you may see a few of the same slides. I'll try to make the punchlines different. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, they said, you know, that, that, that style, that, that lecture that you gave, it kind of looks familiar to me. And I said, well, yeah, my dad was a fantastic man. And uh, a lot of you can attest to that. I absolutely adored him, and he was, he was an end my hero. And I will not uh, back down from that a bit. But he made some mistakes. He was not perfect. And in 1992, he and Greg Grant became good friends. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can still remember the very moment I stumbled upon Greg playing the trumpet or trombone or some brass instrument or something. And, uh, anyway, we, we, we hit it off there. And uh, Dad and he became good friends. And I didn't have any choice. I just sort of... Uh, uh, wound up around uh, Jerry Parsons and Greg Grant. They preach. I'm totally messed up. So it is what it is. We're down here in Tenaha. Uh, it took me an hour and a half to get there. It's worth it. Both directions. It's good to be here with y'all, and I hope y'all can come and see us as well. I've been there for 108 years. So if you haven't been there yet, you're behind the curve. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, Dr. Preach last week mentioned that I was third generation. He correctly introduced me as fourth generation. 
And uh, so we've been there for a long time, mighty proud of it. Ah. It's actually more than 108 years, but nonetheless, uh, that's, the, that's the earliest thing we can find. This right here is something old, something new. Uh, I came up with this title and immediately regretted it. But uh, anyway, we're going to talk about a bunch of old stuff, and then I'll mention some new stuff. And then, you know what? Let me also say that the paper you've got there, I said I was going to talk about certain things that I'm not going to talk about. So they think, you say, did somebody kidnap this guy? And then somebody else came in and gave his lecture for him? You no, know, I just decided to do some different things. So if you'll just give me all fives or whatever, it'll be great. <laughs> I used to tell my students, I said, here are your. Uh, uh, evaluations for the semester, I've taken the liberty of filling them out for you. <laughs> no problem, everything will be just fine. So, over in Tenaha, we started as a strawberry farm in 19, probably around 1913 or 1914. But 1915 is a nice round number, and as I said, that's the first documentation that we have. And no, this is no one in this field is kidding to me that I'm aware of, but there are a bunch of child labor laws being broken in here. <laughs> this guy, I think, is some sort of a, uh, I don't know exactly who or whatever, but uh, uh, there's, there's magnolias back in the back. You can tell this is a nice uh, acidic soil, and these are sandy uh, sugar sands. And so they're perfect for strawberry farming, and that lasted for about five years until somebody around the area decided they start doing it, three or four other families, and they uh, kind of ran us out of the distance, and so then they started growing trees, started growing fruit trees in particular, peaches, plums, apples, pears, you name it. And to this day, of course, we're still selling fruit trees. I'm not going to talk a lot about fruit today, almost none, in fact, because last week that's really all I talked about. But uh, we still do uh, a lot, uh, all of this. You can still come to King's and we'll uh, get you all of the uh, adapted fruit that we can possibly uh, get you. Now, there's, I'm never grown enough. We, we, I'm, we never get enough. We never grow enough. We never do any of that stuff. And so I always uh, hesitate because some of the cool stuff is still a, a few years down the pipe. But uh, anyway, it's not going to keep talking about it. In order to uh, explain to folks you know, what they were going to be getting, not just some uh, stick out there in January, they would have these drawings of beautiful roses or fruit or whatever the case is. And so now we have the internet. And, <laughs> and we don't need these leather bound books any longer. However, uh, we still have them and we're mighty proud of that. I drew lots of arborvitae. That's my great grandmother. That's my great grandfather with a worker out there. As I mentioned, those are sugar sands. Uh, the definition of it, that's my granddad. Some of y'all might have known him. He passed away in 88, but he was the, uh, the real deal, like genuine article of horticulture. So the bunch of us, I'll explain that in a minute. Our great granddad in front of the King Nursery. As I mentioned, we're not King's Nursery until about the late 30s or early 40s. We were the King Nursery, so King's Nursery is not actually 108 years old. <laughs> it's just the same family on the same land doing the same thing, but we changed our name. Uh, anyway, he had an old uh, slogan that went like this, where the name of the firm indicates the class of the stock. And as I've mentioned before, there you go, you got the little buzz there. As I've mentioned before, uh, we all thought, well, how silly. That's, that sounds very 1915-ish. And uh, so, had some students, I'll show you a picture of this right at the very end. Uh, I prepared three hours of the talk today, so I hope you're all uh, ready to go. We'll break in the middle. Uh, but anyway, now you don't know if I'm serious or not. It doesn't matter. Um, but at the end, uh, I've got a picture of uh, a number of students that came to help me once they, uh, students from Texas a &M, once they figured out that I was going to leave and go back and run the nursery, they all, uh, contacted my wife smartly because I told them absolutely not under no circumstances may you come to this place. I'm not prepared for you to come on the property. And they just showed up from New Jersey and San Antonio and all parts in between. And really, really a proud moment for me. But uh, my wife had gotten t-shirts made and they're on the back and said this right here. And one of them wore to work the next week at his greenhouse uh, facility up in New Jersey. And his boss said, that's the coolest slogan I've ever seen. <laughs> and I realized that what is old is new again. And so we're all about that. This is my granddad and his mother out in front of the King Nursery. That building is still there. There's my granddad and his sister. As I mentioned, the true horticulturist that he was, a real deal grafter. And as I've uh, said a lot of times, he'd been out there doing this if you were going to come by the plant or not. He just loved it that. Uh, that was him in his native state. 
And this is my grandmother, who many of you, uh, well, if you've ever called King's Nursery, you've spoken to her. She still answers the phone and uh, can't hear as I'm. <laughs> we'll do everything as backwards as possible. Okay, let me just. How many folks have been to King's Nursery before? And you, and you came here, so lack of judgment. All right, yeah, well, the, those of you who haven't, let me just say, uh, come out there. Um, uh, we don't have much signage on the plants, which means you got to have me. Uh, that's job security. Uh, we don't, uh, it's not easy to get around. I'll make sure there's plenty of poles in the ground. Uh, and then when you need to get checked out, you know, you got to wait on me and you got to go uh, deal with my mother or grandmother or all these various things. So we make sure that it's plenty hard for you to shop with us. And at the end, then, if you have passed that test, you can have those plants. <laughs> and I'm only partially kidding. We don't intend to do it this way. But uh, we're 108 years old, you know, old dogs, new tricks, new tricks. We're working on it. Uh, if there's no, I've told people before, if there's no signage out next year, kick me in the rear end. And I've been kicked in the rear end a number of times, so we won't do that anymore. But that woman right there, she's 91 years old. She huh. will not quit. She doesn't want to quit. She's out there at 8 o'clock every single morning. The other day I was talking to her and she says, yeah, honey, I'm just a little more ready to go at 5 o'clock than I used to be. That's the main difference. And uh, so uh, I wish I was made out of what she's made out of. She still gets up in the trucks if she gets a chance uh, to get up there and check some of those soap flowers out. That's my dad out there. He started at the nursery. Well, he was born on the nursery, despised it. This is the part that I was, I, people get upset at me about it because they knew dad. They get real defensive. I'm like, he's my dad. I think I know these things. But the point is, he did not want to be in the nursery industry at all. He, couldn't stand it, so he went and got a degree in political science, became a banker, and came home one weekend to help his dad with a landscape project, turned his two-week notice in on Monday, and was there forevermore until he passed away in 2012. But he was a great people person, and I don't mean like in a manipulative way. He just loved people. And uh, so it was a really good chance for him to uh, carry on the family business and still be able to study uh, some science that he really, really liked. He, Thought of himself as, uh, I mean, probably a little more highly than he ought in some instances. He thought he could root number two pencils in various things. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, uh, this is something that I'm sure he would root, because he used to say this. I used to think I could root number two pencils, and then all of a sudden he didn't realize that 20 years later his son would be taking pictures like this and going around telling people what he said. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, he was really, really a good plantsman. And, uh, a good people person. I grew up there. That's my sweet mama. She still works out there. I came home January of 2020 and I told her, I said, I'm going to come home in a year and I'm going to take this place over and I'm going to, she started, oh, she, she doesn't like this because she's not real emotional in front of people, but she, a little tear came down her face and she said, I'll work as hard as I can for you. And she skipped that promise. And, uh, oh, that's so sweet. But, so, and she's the one right now back at the nursery. She said, Where is he? What is he doing? Why is he here? You know, but uh, she's a super duper uh, sweet lady and uh, just a great place to grow up. Uh, I absolutely uh, loved uh, my childhood and uh, I'm very grateful that I can say that. Uh, I mentioned that my dad had some real issues as far as uh, choosing friends and, and allowing me to be around people who were of questionable character. And, uh, <laughs> so in uh, 2000, I went to uh, Stephen F. Austin and uh, knew I was going to do that. I uh, wanted to go. I had uh, already been over there, I felt like, for four or five years before that. Knew everybody. Learned what I could from this guy, which of course was a whole lot. But obviously I got to the point where I didn't listen much anymore. Uh, but I did in my junior year, sit in there in the air conditioning when my mom and dad were out there sweating. And I realized, I think I could do what that guy's doing. And uh, so I decided I, at some point in time, would like to teach. I didn't realize that really, I really got the teaching book from my dad in the first place. Uh, he was a teacher. I told my uncle once, I said, my dad missed his calling. He said, what do you mean? He said, he should have been a teacher. He said, you moron, he was a teacher. <laughs> well, you're exactly right about that. And we need teachers. Why do we need teachers? We need teachers because of stuff like this. All right, this is... I don't, uh, this is NASA, Houston, all right? And that sign right there says, well, first of all, that's a crepe myrtle from China. That's Chinese button bush from 
China. All right. That's Mexican feather grass from Mexico. And the sign says, Go native. <laughs> okay. So this is our government dollars at work. I don't want to offend anybody, but we'll just move on. Uh, so as an educator, this was my favorite part by far. Uh, getting to take people uh, out into the field and getting to introduce my students to industry people. Getting to introduce the industry people to my students. And uh, uh, I, I shouldn't say this out loud, but these two right here, we wound up getting them together. Uh, they're going to get married next year and they asked me to perform the ceremony. So that's sweet stuff for me. But these people are all uh, important to me as well. And so that's the thing that I enjoyed the most. Now, eventually I got to the point where I realized it was time for me to leave because they started drawing stuff like this on the back of my quizzes <laughs> and uh, making fun of my little idiosyncrasies. And I realized that uh, idiosyncrasy sounds a whole lot like idiot. And, uh, uh, I will, I'll just let you make the punchline here. Uh, but then I realized this looks familiar too. <laughs> so I had to get back home and get away from all of that mess. And in fact, we all know that college is important, but plants are important. And so, um, all right, let's talk about plants. That's what you came here for. Uh, some old, some new, we're going to talk about uh, stuff you've heard of before, but hopefully I'll be able to put a little twist on it. Maybe get you to think about something you hadn't thought of uh, before. Vitex, why in the world would you start with Vitex? Well, I like Vitex. They're, dis they're deciding down in Central Texas, oh, these things are um, invasive. Uh, I, I'll buck that all the way, uh, as far as I can, at least. There are some streams, some little... Uh, um, wetland areas where there are some seedlings that are coming up, fine, I'm, I'm okay with that, I understand that, so we'll call that aggressive. Uh, this thing's been around for at least 150 years. There's huh. one out there in late, uh, mid, mid to late 1800s that was planted out there uh, right outside of Alto. All right, so uh, they call it pepper tree as well. Uh, the fact is, is that it is not invasive. Uh, you can call it aggressive at certain times if you want to, but for us, it doesn't even do that. I don't really find a whole bunch of seedlings or anything like that. If you do, plant them up. That's okay. Uh, of course, uh, they're beautiful. I like them as these big, you know, uh, uh, small to medium-sized trees. Uh, this is a lot of Tyler pictures. I just realized that I put these in there for you. Look out. There's uh, Greg's uh, version that he found on one of those uh, Meals on Wheels. I mean, uh, 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 <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. That wasn't Meals on Wheels, that's for sure. Anyway, uh, one of these field trips down to central Louisiana. This thing had longer uh, bloom spikes than uh, Shoal Creek, and longer bloom spikes than uh, Montrose Purple, which were the uh, sort of gold standard at the time. And I still think that it's one of the very best of the true sort of traditional uh, tree form of Itex that you can find. Uh, if I showed you this, many of you, unless you've been there, Dallas Arboretum would not realize that was Vitex. All right, why? Because well, uh, even Greg is starting to get to the point where he cuts them down uh, virtually every year and lets them grow back. That's a, that's a way to grow these things. That's fine. But if you don't uh, cut, if you cut them down, you're not going to ever get this bark. Now, I'm a huge fan of bark. You eventually get tired of me talking about bark. In fact, one of the, uh, I think I can say this, statute of limitations. Who are we showing this to? Anybody? Is it online right now? I don't, I'll say it. I'll, I'll deal with the consequences. One of my uh, higher ups at AM and uh, got to the point where he was so tired of me talking about the bark that he came around and said, dude, nobody cares about the bark. <laughs> <laughs> and then I come to places like this and people like the bark. And I said, I really, I'm with my people. I found my people. If I'm with a bunch of people that don't like the bark, I'm in the wrong place. So anyway, if I text bark, probably not something you thought you'd talk about today, but I think if we get into the minutia on some of these things, we begin to appreciate these plants more. We begin to appreciate our gardens more, and we're spending more time in our gardens. And one thing Dr. Huh. Creech would always say, and it's absolutely true, he would say in the plant propagation, but it's true in any aspect of horticulture, the most important ingredient in the propagator's uh, propagation bed is the propagator's shadow. All right? But you can think about that. Spend some time mulling that one over. But it's true in your garden. It's true in anything that you do. Nothing 
I got all kinds of customers, and I love them to death. They come out and say, we want something that's going to be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, and I don't want to have to take care of it. <laughs> I said, can I introduce you to these soap farmers, please? <laughs> all right, so I think that's still important. Flip side, no, I'm not a new rapper. This is the flip side of Vitex, all right? And uh, this is the newer uh, aspect. Now, there's all kinds of new Vitex out there. This is kind of the... The latest uh, trend in the last 10 to 15 years for all of these uh, Vitex to be uh, patented and to be branded. And uh, lots of different uh, groups have their own Vitex, but this is one that comes out of, I believe it's uh, first editions. Anyway, uh, this is Mike Durr plant. Flip side, why do they call it that? We're going to grow it as more of a shrub, less of a tree. And this is one that I would agree with Greg that we may want to cut down every year and let it grow back. Uh, almost sort of like a perennial we would do, but why do we call it flip side? Because the back of the foliage looks like that. If you get any sort of a breeze whatsoever, even when it's not blooming, you've got a nice purple effect. All right. So when the foliage is doing the work for us, that's a real big benefit. So flip side Vitex, I'm a big fan of. I never ever thought I'd start uh, right at the very beginning of the talk talking about pink eye. All right. Uh, I, I, Bink has almost always been something that we've had because we had to have it. All right, everybody wants it in the summertime, and it's a good plant for us. The only issue is it's Phytophthora, this fungal uh, issue that's going to end up uh, coming in and uh, and wiping stuff out almost overnight. All right, it's an aerial disease, and so there's almost no way to prevent it, other than to plant plants that are in the uh, at least uh, resistant to that. Uh, Cora XDR. Uh, is the series that is, uh, to my knowledge, the most resistant. The, the, the traditional looking Vinca or periwinkle uh, that is the most resistant to Phytophthora and uh, to a lot of other diseases as well. And uh, one of my students is uh, one that uh, worked on this project, and so that's a real thing that I'm proud of as well. Uh, so I like that. Make sure you're using the right one. Don't just plant any old Vinca. Make sure you get one that's truly disease resistant. And this XDR is more resistant than the traditional Cora series, and there's going to be consistently more resistant varieties coming out all the time. Now, what I really like in Vinca, and the real reason why I'm talking about it, are these Soiree uh, Kawaii series. All right, small little flowers. They're going to be uh, less than a quarter uh, in, in size, but they are born in profusion. And this is a strawberry color, but this is my favorite by far. This is light purple. And that plant is the most um, I would say it is the most manicured uh, vinca I've ever seen in my life, and there's no manicure in being done. All right, this is September in Overton, Texas, uh, and we all know what that can be like. Uh, so ultimately, that is going to be a plant that you're going to want. That's about, I think, uh, I think it's about six plants. All right, maybe it's twelve. Somebody here can probably tell me. Maybe I'll plant six. six. See. <laughs> Don't ever talk about this sort of stuff in front of these people. <laughs> well, actually, that's my five-year-old's favorite word. These days. Actually, <laughs> so it's not stuff you're going to get beat up. All right, Cornus capitata, subspecies and angustata Ellsbury. Let's just call it the evergreen dogwood or for some China dogwood. Uh, I know that you guys lost yours over here in the idea garden. It had to stop me. I quite like uh, what I saw this particular day as I took this picture out there. It was uh, late May, but it was a warm day already. We'd already had a couple, three weeks of heat in that particular year. And uh, I realized that this thing was out there. Now, I've also heard from many of you that it was slow, and I've also heard all these various things. But let me tell you, Preach is doing some pretty good stuff with these over there at Stephen and Boston. And I'm really excited about the potential there. We're trying to select some good seedlings out and all these various things. Now, somebody might say, I mean, if you saw that, you'd say dogwood. Uh, and I absolutely uh, agree. Now, you wouldn't say same old dogwood. There's something about that dogwood, maybe you could say. Uh, but I just adore this thing. This is the one that was over here uh, in the idea garden. Uh, if, I were, if someone were going to say, I want a cornus species and I want to grow it in more sun, uh, this is the one that I would point you to. Uh, I don't put it in full sun. I didn't say that. But more sun. All right? This plant, which I love, Born looking for a place to die. All right. Uh, first of all, we'll oftentimes get seedlings uh, that come from Oregon. We've done it before. All right. Uh, this is not a good thing. There's a thing called provenance. It's not just in art, but it's in uh, horticulture as well. 
All right, and provenance says that if you've got a plant that has been adapted to a specific area and it's giving off seed, collect those seed. All right, that just stands to reason. Use those seed and you'll wind up with uh, a good percentage of those that are uh, more adapted to your area than those that come from Oregon or those that come from wherever else that might be. Now, as I mentioned, this I like to put in, in a lot of shade, all right? The ideal spot would be where the roots of this thing were in full shade and the canopy could get up there and do some more sun, some dappled sun, and that's really where these things shine, where they're the most beautiful. This one, uh, obviously, out here in this area, uh, can handle a little bit more of the sun. And so I, I really do think that it's a more adaptable uh, version. Not a perfect equivalent, but it's one of my favorites nonetheless. And of course, I mean, who, how do you, how do you fight that? You know, except for, anybody ever heard of a man, uh, a man named Bob Dylan? <laughs> All right. Bob Dylan wrote the song, uh, Rock Me Like a Wagon Wheel. Did y'all know he wrote that song? All right. So I told my students this, and they all thought, no, Darius Rucker wrote that song. <laughs> he says, I was thumbing my way out of North Carolina. I was picking me a bouquet of dogwood flowers. And I've got a problem with Bob. Because nobody ever wanted a bouquet of dogwood flowers. They all wanted a bouquet of dogwood bracts. This is the bract. All right. This is why I'm not invited to parties. <laughs> Nobody wants this sort of thing. All right? When I tell somebody that a rose does not have a thorn, but it has a prickle, that's when they glaze over. And then they say, well, explain to me why everybody says thorns. And I say, it is the hallmark disease. So what do you mean? Well, you'll pay $7 for a card that says, before I met you, dear, I was so forlorn. Now I've gone and found my rose among the thorns. <laughs> you will not pay seven dollars for it. Before I met you, dear, I was in quite the pickle. <laughs> now I've gone and found my rose amongst the pricks. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Daddy would not sell a pink dogwood. Uh, I got to the point where somebody came by and talked me into it. They said, "Look, they're going to buy them anyway. They might as well buy a good one from you." And I said, "Okay, that's fine, but I'm just going to." Send them home with the last rites and all those various things. But this is one of my favorites. This is uh, Cherokee Brave, and it's actually red for a slight period of time. It's going to be red here less than it's going to be red in North Carolina or Tennessee, but it still is going to be red. And the flowers, like, oh, look at me go, the bracts last year were as wide as my hand. Right. So a uh, really, really big fan of that. Again, perfect spot. Maybe it, take care of it, and it'll take care of you. Uh, if not, let's do something different. Styrax japonicus. This is one that, uh, as a, a student in uh, Stephen F. Austin, again, I was trained backwards, not only by my dad, but by Dr. Creech as well. If it was not obscure and nobody had ever heard of it, we didn't want to talk about it. And I realized that quickly there was a reason why nobody had ever heard about it and nobody wanted to talk about it. But this is Styrax japonicus, and we can actually not do that. You know, I'm going to put them in more shade than this, but this is the overall uh, uh, canopy. This is the overall habit of the thing. But really what we're talking about is walking underneath the canopy and those flowers are hanging down and sort of looking at We don't have a whole lot of plants that will do that for us. All right, so this is just pure Styrax japonicus and uh, the bark. All right, this is Atlanta Botanical Garden where that bark has uh, done a nice little twisting, uh, sort of a basket shape. So Styrax japonicus in some nice heart shade. If it's going to be in the sun, make it the morning sun. And uh, that will be a really good small tree uh, for you. Laurel Pedlin, why in the world would you talk about Laurel Pedlin? Two years ago, we lost every Laurel Pedlin or lost a whole bunch of them or whatever. Well, this is why. We still don't have anything that does that, all right? We started, the first time I remember Laurel Pedlin was about 20, 25 years ago, something like that. And we started growing them and we were selling them as shrubs. And, you know, everybody wants to keep them three foot tall, and then we start cutting them, and then we start realizing, hey, maybe we were reducing their cold tolerance, and maybe we're reducing their toughness and their vigor and all these various things. And, and ultimately, this is what they want to do anyway. This is what they do in their native uh, in China, all right? We don't have anything that is that showy and as far as a, a nice uh, pot is concerned, all right? So really, really cool strap-like flowers, a really, really great plant. Now we have plants that will grow to three foot tall, that will grow to four foot tall, all right? They're branded, they're patented, they're more expensive, but it requires you to trim a whole lot less. Instead of trying to trim a 15 foot plant to a three foot tall, that's a whole lot better. Crimson Fire is okay, 
Cerise Charm is okay. To be honest, I like the Jazz Hands uh, versions. I just don't have a fantastic opinion of Jazz Hands. Uh, jazz Hands, now, here's the problem. There's about six Jazz Hands out there, all right? So I particularly like the Jazz Hands Dwarf, and uh, there's a couple of the other ones that are really, really good. But uh, if we get zero degrees, all bets are off, all right? I've been telling people that for two years. And then we get nine degrees, and nine degrees was worse than zero. We didn't have a foot of snow over it to blanket everything. So uh, I didn't lose a greenhouse in nine degrees, but we did have a, and I actually did okay at the nursery, but I had a lot of friends that had a worse time in nine degrees than we did in zero. Did y'all get nine, what'd y'all get here? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's not do that anymore. I don't ever want to deal with zero again in my lifetime. I am uh, obliged, I am contractually obligated to talk about Chinese fringe tree. Uh, my dad uh, sort of helped to make this thing uh, a little more popular in our area. And uh, the Wilson Drive planting over in Stephen and Boston came from him. And it doesn't look very good anymore, I'm sad to say. But nonetheless, uh, this plant is the plant that I show people when they say, well, I think that they're starting to sort of not look very good. This plant is about 60 years old. It's been transplanted twice. It lives in College Station, which is not Horticulture Hill, but Perkins for it for certain. <laughs> okay. So, what do we love about this? Well, this is the most uh, floriferous version, it's easy for me to say, that I've ever seen. Just absolutely filled uh, up. This came from Tom Dodd's nursery in Alabama by way of Lynn Lowry, who is a, a father of Texas horticulture for us here. Uh, again, the bark. All right. You're sitting underneath that. Uh, try to have a bad time go for the picnic underneath that tree. I don't think it's possible. I mentioned that I would spend a little time to, oh, Chinese French tree. I see them 35 foot tall down in Houston. Uh, Heidi Sheasley on her place at Tree Search Farm says a beautiful one that's that just massive. But uh, generally, and I say 15, 18 foot tall is, is what it tells me. Uh, and again, they're growing in a lot more adapted spots. So it's not one of those acid loving things that it can grow. They're growing in the college station as well. Uh, Japanese persimmon or Asian persimmon, I view this as an ornamental. Uh, you can certainly eat that fruit, and it's good. And as I mentioned last week, I've gotten to the point where I sort of like it. I like to eat them when they're not uh, uh, to the point where you don't have to chew them. Generally, I like to chew my food, you know, instead of just swallow it. Uh, but I can be a bit afraid about these things. I like boiled okra. Uh, but uh, Asian persimmon here, when that thing gets frosted, uh, it's going to be ready to go. Now, there are some that are not... Uh, uh, stringent, so non astringent varieties like Fuyu, which is the most popular by far. You can eat that before it gets uh, truly ripe and it won't bugger you up. But look, this is October. That's a jack o' lantern plant. Right? Why in the world don't we have these all over the place? Because, no, cold has been an issue the last two years. But before that, we hadn't had much trouble with that. It's a plant that's fairly easy. And as I mentioned uh, to the folks last week, uh, this particular plant right here is one that has been in my family's backyard for 85 years, all right? And my grandmother had it cut down, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> this is one of the problems with the fruit. <laughs> Customer this last year said, I've got game camera pictures of a coyote jumping up in the tree and getting one of those uh, down. And I said, uh, well, could you send them to me? And he, he forgot. Anyway, the next year, he, he comes back, and I forgot it was him. And I was telling him, I said, you would not believe the pictures I'd say. He said, like this one right here? <laughs> yeah, send it to me. So anyway, that is proof that coyotes uh, can jump. All right. Uh, Texas persimmon. This is one that I sort of got enamored with down in College Station. To be honest with you, it's not perfect for us. But if you got a real hot, dry area that's going to drain real, real well and never stay real, real wet, Texas persimmon is a good choice. It's not going to bloom beautifully. It's going to make these little black fruit. You can technically eat them. You can get, uh, the birds love them. So a really good wildlife huh. out there. But this is the thing, right? That bark. Again, we're halfway through, and I've already talked about bark about six times. <laughs> He's got a problem, folks. All right, red buds. Um, I love red buds. We have a problem with red buds. All of the cool red buds, and I shouldn't say all, but almost all, the cool red buds are uh, bred in Tennessee and North Carolina. 
in hot. Tennessee and North Carolina uh, can get hot. I've been there before. Uh, but they don't stay hot. And it's not nearly as uh, rigorous and vigorous as the heat is here. So we wind up with all kinds of red buds that sort of dot our landscapes. And I've got two out front that I've killed at my house. And all these various things. It's not that big of a deal for me to kill plants, believe it or not. When I got to AM, one of my uh, major characteristics that apparently came through the students, they always said, hey, Dr. King, he's a really nice guy, but he's tough on plants. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact is, yeah, if they don't want to be here, we don't want them here. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on with that. This is a place up in Tennessee, uh, the Newbowers place, Hidden Hollow Nursery. They had about 50 varieties planted out of various red buds, and they worked with Denny Werner, who is the foremost uh, red bud huh. breeder. Anyway, Denny had all of his stuff out there, Ace of Hearts and all these various things. He had stuff that was underneath cover that no one was to see, and so you got 50 horticulturists in a room, you got 50 thieves in a room. And so we all go over there and figure out what it is, and yeah, you know, we knew what it was in the first place, we didn't even need to look, and that sort of thing. You know? But this was Flamethrower. Flamethrower was the new one that was there about, we were there in Chattanooga about three years ago. Uh, they grew it in North Carolina and sold it in North Carolina for a year before they would let it out. And uh, finally it was liberated and uh, laid it down here. And this was College Station two years ago. All right. Uh, I, I kind of like let this thing grow as a small little, uh, instead of a huge, big, uh, small tree, uh, almost kind of like a, a, a shrub style thing. But just, you gotta let it, uh, you gotta let it arch over it to really get the effect of the flame the part. Now, last year it didn't look this good. I am, I'm less like this is the reason why three years ago I didn't jump on the bandwagon because I wasn't sure I wanted to be on the wagon. You know, and I, I'm still not 100% sure. Now, some that I am real uh, pleased about. This is Silver Cloud. Uh, I was driving down University Drive in Nacogdoches and called Dr. Priest and said, "What is that blooming out here?" This was about uh, late May, early June. He said, uh, nothing that I know of. Anyway, it wasn't blooming. It was this right here. And so again, when we let the foliage do the work for us, we're gonna wind up a lot happier than when we were uh, enjoying a bloom for maybe two or three or four weeks. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, there are some, this is uh, floating cloud, sorry. That's got a little bit more orange in it. Uh, so both of those seem to be just fine. But you'll notice again, that's a lot of shade, okay? So in general, we're planting red buds out in the full sun. So if you want a red bud, if you want it to be long-lived uh, in any way, you want to make sure that you plant it in some shade. Uh, the rising sun may be the exception. I really like this particular one. It did quite well for us, again, down there in the middle of campus. And uh, the chartreuse would eventually uh, give off some new growth that was sort of a pinkish color. And I really think the rising sun is one that's really quite good for us. It's Henderson. All right, and uh, over there last summer I stopped, and uh, this is what that looks like out there in front of one of those gardens. So, good, uh, good choice. If you want a red leaf one, I still like Forest Pansy. Uh, lots of people want to plant Merlot. They'll say Merlot has Texas blood in it. True, but the Texas blood that Merlot has in it is kind of wimpy, to be frank. And so I still like Forest Pansy. Uh, it's hard to beat that. All right. Now, again, notice even that is in some cover, so it's got a little bit of shade in it. Eastern red bud, Circus canadensis. We have Texas red bud, Circus texensis, or Circus canadensis variety texensis, depending on which botanist you subscribe to. Um, and then there's the Mexican uh, red bud. And the, the reason I put this here is because the smaller and the thicker the leaf, it's uh, the, uh, the, the Mexican ones are the smallest and thickest leaves. The Texas ones are a little bit larger and a little bit less thick, and the eastern ones are very thin and very large. Why? Because they lose moisture through those leaves, and it's not a big deal, because Virginia is full of water. Uh, Mexico, not so much. So we need more Texas and Mexican blood in our red buds, and we're working on that. Um, this should aggravate us that our best Texas red bud was found in the Arbuckle Mountains in Oklahoma. <laughs> and it's called Oklahoma. That should really uh, bother us, but uh, nonetheless, it, it, it's true. If you get an Oklahoma red bud, it's a, it's a winner. Fire and almond, 
You say, I thought you were going to talk about new stuff. I said, I was going to talk about old stuff too. Flower and almond is one of my favorites. This plant is uh, one of those grandmother plants in my estimation. All right, It was in front of everybody's house 60 and 70 and 80 years ago. And so uh, I really, really adore it. Some people call it dwarf flower and almond. But uh, you get this uh, about a week or two from now, this starts to happen. And uh, they're double forms. Generally, you're, that's all you're really going to find. And it's just going to sit there and do that. Now, in the summertime, it's going to be a green bush. But guess what? That's OK. All right? Green plant is all right because of what it provides for us uh, in terms of color in the area of the year, in the time of the year when we need color. Uh, Philadelphia's or mock orange or this always bothered me. English dogwood, right? Never have uh, exactly understood that. But nonetheless, English dogwood, typically a nice fountain shape, but doesn't always look like that. But that flower right there is really, really fantastic. And I'm a huge fan of English dogwood. Philadelphus, mock orange. All right. Um, I mentioned the. Uh, Okay, my dad used to say this, it's true for me too. Son, nobody ever accused me of being a good businessman. It's absolutely true. I'd rather talk about plants than make your, my way into your wallet. That's not ever been all that important to us. And, and we can prove it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I've always uh, sort of viewed this as uh, meeting a, uh, a public need rather than running a business. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the first uh, slide there had the fact that we're on Facebook. This is a video that I put on Facebook last year. I'll do that periodically as well. Not periodically enough for some people, but periodically nonetheless. This is one on uh, deciduous magnolias. And uh, deciduous magnolias, as you have seen around town, and it did, this just happened like out of nowhere. I drove down to uh, Southeast Texas uh, early this week, and it was like, bam, deciduous magnolia time. Saucer magnolias are, are wow. one of our deciduous magnolias. Now, saucers are interesting because saucer magnolias are going to bloom before everything else, right? And generally, what happens is they bloom out there two, two or three weeks and then they get frozen. And so, uh, what I really like about like this, this is not a true saucer magnolia. This is a cross between uh, uh, magnolia dindida and, and magnolia liliiflora. And uh, what they did was in the 60s. Uh, up at the U.S. National Arboretum, they did a bunch of crosses, and they released seven of them, and they called it the Little Girl Series. Before that was apparently creepy. <laughs> and uh, there's uh, Susan, and there's Anne, and there's Jane, and there's one called Ricky, and I think there's one called Nikki, and there's two others that I can't think of right now. But nonetheless, uh, Susan uh, is not one that I was familiar with until the last maybe five or six or seven years. Uh, Anne and Jane are by far the most popular, and they're the ones you see the most often. And there's good reason, they're big. And Susan grows to be about 10, 12 foot tall, max, and uh, has those really, really sort of nice wine-colored buds, real heavy wine-colored buds, and then they open up to a nice. Uh, they're just, uh, I noticed them in the Arboretum in Nacogdoches yesterday, they're just now beginning to unfurl. So even the ones that are two or three weeks later than the saucer magnolias are early this year because of our unseasonably warm weather. All right? So uh, I'm concerned that we are going to have uh, apple blossoms and peach blossoms and all of these various things and magnolia blossoms that are going to fall off. But what are we going to do? Uh, New York City, get a room, right? Uh, this plant comes from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, 1972, and uh, Elizabeth Magnolia. This was the first one uh, that came out, the first uh, uh, cultivar that came out that got people thinking, we're going to have a yellow magnolia here for sure. And we have done the yellow birds, and we've done all these various things, and uh, I've, it's not that I'm less impressed, but they're not, they're not easy. Not always. They don't always. They don't always provide for us what we want. Elizabeth seems to be pretty good. All right. Elizabeth does a pretty good job of, of giving us a nice creamy white to pale yellow flower, uh, particularly the pale yellow bud. All right. So Elizabeth's a great one. I also uh, have one called Daybreak, 
and of course and pertains to those various things as well. So this is the time to be thinking about those. Actually, fall is the time to be thinking about them, but nobody ever does. So they wait until when they're going to think about them. So it's all right, you can still plan. Royal Purple Smoke Tree, which we find in almost every um, uh, perennial order in England, all over the UK. And we can actually grow this thing here. Again, I like to give it a little bit of protection, but uh, what a cool plant to give us that uh, Aggie Maroon, <laughs> or uh, Burgundy, or whatever your preference is. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, Royal Purple is a really good choice. I like all the smoke trees, but they can be a little bit uh, <laughs> sticky, we'll say. Uh, Rhododendron Australian, uh, what a lot of people call native azaleas. Uh, whether they're truly native to our area or not, kind of gets into some of the taxonomy and various things. A lot of them are native to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and of course in parts of East Texas as well. But uh, lots of different colors. If you want a, a cool challenge and you want something totally different, an out of the norm, uh, these are good choices. This is Sissinghurst Garden, south and east of London. And uh, I, I led a study abroad there in 2019, so we took an exploratory trip there in 2018, so I got a chance to go visit this thing that I had heard Greg Grant drone on about for hours. <laughs> and I got there and it was better than he had said. And I, so this is my favorite garden in the world that I'm aware of. Uh, but anyway, Sissy Gurr's down there in, in uh, the south and east of the UK. It's a fantastic place. If you have a chance to go, you, you, know, you should try it. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, actually a happy accident, Bob Ross style, where the uh, native azaleas, uh, the Australians, were what these had been planted onto, what these had been rooted onto, uh, grafted onto, I should say. And after the uh, rhododendrons that were on top of these rootstocks died out, these popped up. And now they couldn't imagine this garden without them. Yeah, so, so it's really nice. <laughs> Uh, another azalea, this is a, this is a rhododendron indica, Coromo shikaboo, uh, which is just fun to say, really the only reason I'm putting it here. Uh, no, I love it, they, they call it uh, purple uh, uh, spider azalea, or whatever the common name uh, that you choose might be. They have an interesting scent, which a lot of our azaleas uh, don't, some do, but anyway, really, really great plant. And this is the one, that, again, that are planted on the, uh, the drive over there at uh, University Drive in Nacogdoches. About 800 feet worth of them. And they've just been sitting there blooming their heads off for years. Huh. Huh. Really, really good choice. Uh, you say, uh, you're weird, Dr. King, and I say, uh, agree. I don't disagree. I will also say that not only do I have a favorite garden in the world, but I also have a favorite bed of a garden. And it's not in the same place. Salvia. You don't have any salvia in your yard. Let's change that. Let's, we need to change that. And this is my favorite bed of any garden in the world. And you say it's not spectacular. I agree. Uh, it would be later. But this bed is about 50 feet long by uh, about 15 feet wide. This is in Edinburgh, Scotland. And that has uh, about 400 different salvia in that bed. None of them are duplicated. Okay? So they're all different salvia. So if you want to have a salvia garden, you can do it. And in fact, you'll have a nice little uh, garden for nine months out of the year here. All right? So I'm really a huge fan of all these various salvia. Some of them are not as good for us as others, but uh, you know, we can work on that. Bog sage, uh, looking noensis or something like that. Uh, that's bog sage, which gives us a uh, near electric blue, all right? We don't get that color in nature very often, believe it or not. We oftentimes get pinks and purples, but that color right there is one that we really like. Wendy's Wish, which is a patented variety, so I can't propagate it. But nonetheless, uh, it's uh, uh, a nice uh, plant for that super uh, bright magenta. Not nearly as tough as Greg's Henry Dulberg or Vesla Dulberg or any of those various things or uh, some of those other Perinaceas, but Still does quite well, especially if we'll give it just a smidgen of protection in the summer. Salvia so here in Nitica, <laughs> once you get that in your yard, you got it. Uh, not that it's a, a weed or anything like that, but I'm still I'm a fan of black and blue sage. All right, Salvia so Gregia, you know, the San Antonio Botanical Garden, San Antonio. That's concrete on both sides. You do the math. It's about 
1,027 degrees in the summer, and that thing sitting there just doing its thing. Salvia Gregia. No, not Greg Grant. All right. I believe his name is Josiah Greg. I've gone around the world trying to convince them that Greg Grant, he didn't, he didn't do everything. Uh, I haven't picked on Greg at all today. And last week, I, I, I did that on purpose, because last week I left and I thought, maybe I'll put stuff on it. And then I thought, nah. Uh, Salvia Darcy, I, uh, my favorite picture of this, I don't think I've got it in here, but I, I've also I've got a picture of this in Scotland as well, so really, really great plan. Uh, Mexican native, and uh, super duper bright red, and it's probably going to be a Texas superstar in the next year or two. Uh, so really, really good plan for us. But again, not in a wet spot, put it in a nice... So that's red, that's pinks, that's blues. And again, with the salvia similitis, this is an annual in my book. You may get it through a year if it's real, real mild. But super duper uh, nice little matte here, and then that's electric blue in my book. All right, I love that electric blue, blue flower. All right, I'm, I'm coming down the home stretch here. Rose King Verbena, uh, this is one that Greg and Dad sort of worked on. Actually, a UPS driver brought it to the nursery. Greg got a hold of it and uh, named it after uh, our family. Uh, the best I can say about this, again, I hope this isn't going anywhere, uh, it lives at my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this bed right here is out in front of our, our church there in Tenaha, and uh, it sits there, uh, bakes in the summer, uh, after zero degrees, because of the snow, again, we still had green foliage on this thing after that. Now, we, have, we don't have much uh, green foliage after nine, but it's still alive and it will be just fine. So I'm a huge fan of this particular one. And the best vote of confidence, again, that I can give it is College Station, Texas. That's one plant that was planted a month and a half after these three plants of uh, Homestead Purple. Homestead Purple is a great plant. I love it. All right. If there's three of those, there's one of those. This thing will go. All right. It'll take care of some, some area for you if you need it. So I'm a huge fan of rose. Porterweed. If you want butterflies, you want hummingbirds, you gotta have porterweed, in my estimation. All right, this thing will continue to bloom all the way up, sequentially up this, this, this stem, and so it's really, really fantastic plant. This is one that was over at the Arboretum uh, for many years, uh, sort of a terracotta uh, bloom or salmon bloom. Those will get to be four or five foot tall. There's a purple that's four or five foot tall. If uh, you can get a red that's more of a dwarf, all right, that's two to three foot tall. There's a dwarf purple. I can't tell any difference between the dwarf purple and the blue, to be totally frank. Uh, there is a difference, but there's not much. So if you uh, find one of those, uh, you should uh, definitely go at that thing. I'm, I'm a huge fan of these. And, and they do fairly well, okay? Uh, the, the winter's gonna be a tendency. So you, if you can mulch it or you can protect it somehow, uh, that's gonna really do you uh, a favor. In the summertime, they're gonna be just fine. Uh, they're native to, a bunch of them native to Jamaica. All right, this is, I didn't, I did not uh, stay in this photo. Those are real butterflies. So they actually quite like this thing. Mexican giant cigar plant, lots of people have used uh, David Berry and Kufia in the past, which I love, but this is uh, Kufia labia. All right, that's about six foot tall. And somebody said, well, I don't have room for it. So we live in Texas, you got room for it. It's okay, <laughs> spread it out a little bit. You know? So uh, they use these really effectively now at the Antique Rose Emporium in Brim, um, or Independence. But uh, really, really ah. a good plant for us. A little bit more yellow than uh, you typically get out of the big berry. And again, summertime, it doesn't even bathe it. And the hummingbirds absolutely love it. Uh, Country Girl Mom. I wish people would think about mums when they weren't blooming. I wish people would think about mums, uh, well, you can plant them in the fall, it's just fine, but I wish you'd plant them in the spring too. A lot of people don't do it, they won't fiddle with them. But the Country Girl is the most popular, it's the one that kind of gets people interested in the first place, and uh, of course it is a lodger. It will grow up to be about three foot tall and then fall over and do all these various things. So it's not perfect by any stretch, but uh, in that fall period when we need some good color, it does, uh, it can do the trick for us. And of course, it's really, really beautiful depending on where you put it. Greg's Mildred Golden, uh, totally different. This will eat your grandchildren. It will then spit them out. Uh, and it will look for some more. Uh, we had this out front of the nursery there uh, for many years. And uh, again, this was out there in the place where it didn't get water in the summer. It just 
had to deal with it, and it did. So uh, I tell people to put it in the corner, uh, and uh, then we do, when you don't want it somewhere else. Or, uh, or if you're uh, allowed to, and you would uh, do it, stick around no time. Uh, Calinopus, all right, some people call this Texas Primrose. Uh, I'm just a huge fan. There's now proven winter versions of this. Uh, uh, so it's, it's getting better, more floriferous all the time. So uh, we had a mound out there, a little mat out there in front of the nursery for years. That was probably four or five years where it was getting heat every summer and it was still just uh, taking a lick and kept on. Peter's purple uh, bee balm. I uh, won't we'll talk a whole lot more about that. But so those are I love bee balms, of course. Uh, Texas gold columbine, uh, a nice shade perennial. I put it in uh, a good heavy piece of, uh, of shade, and so I'm a big fan of, of that one. Uh, Silver Falls, uh, Dachandra, or Silver Ponyfoot, which is what we all should call it. It's one of my favorites, again, of the, uh, I did my PhD on turkey tangle frog fruit. Uh, <laughs> so Silver Ponyfoot fits right on in. But uh, people wonder how to use this thing. And I really, really like this. This is that, uh, another broken egg down there in College Station, Texas. I'm not sponsored by them, but uh, uh, they do make a nice gluten free pancake. Uh, so anyway, that, I think that's one thing you can certainly do with it. And it's, again, that's much heat, and uh, it's really doing quite a good job there. Bat face cupia, if you want to try to get the kids, the grandkids into gardening, this is one of your favorites. Why? Because it looks like a bat face when you look down at it, and because they can call each other bat face and get by with it. And uh, anyway, that's at Zilker Botanical Garden in Austin, spilling over into the parking lot in the summer. So again, very heat tolerant. Zinnia and Gustafolia, I'm a huge fan of the um, various zinnias, uh, particularly the Percusion series. I really love that one. I like, I, I like the zinnias that are a little bit easier to work with in our gardens. And so this is a Mexican native, the Angustifolia, which has got a nice sort of uh, light orange or dark orange or white, typically the way those come in the summertime, those things are rocking and rolling. Pineapple guava. Uh, a lot of people want to make fruit with it. Dr. Creech and Tim Hartman are working on that right now. That's all well and good, but I love it as a Yopon substitute. Uh, now, it needs to have some cold, uh, some cold protection. No question about it. Not going to be as cold tolerant as Yopon is. But this is a place where I uh, gained a little bit of weight over there at the uh, barbecue joint at College Station and uh, Rudy's. And uh, this thing was out there in front of their smokehouse, so it's getting some protection. But they're planting them all over the place now and uh, seem to be doing quite well. They're not going to uh, bloom uh, typically and, uh, and make fruit for us. They bloom typically. But they're not going to make fruit for us, but I just like that ornamental. Uh, that's Colerotaria. Uh, well, these are actually Bipanata, but, but we grow Colerotaria paniculata, and uh, it's a little more cold hardy for us. But it's always kind of frustrating me why Colerotaria is not more popular than it is. It's a tree with uh, huge, uh, you know, big uh, panicles and uh, blooms and then uh, uh, seed pods, and they're really, really uh, uh, attractive. So I, I think if you're looking for a, a very attractive uh, uh, tree, typically you know, 30, 40, 50 feet, depending on something like that, uh, that's one of my favorites, so consider golden rain tree. That's not right or camellia. I don't have those for sale, and I probably won't for three or four years because they're slow. But that's the darkest thing I've ever seen. And a buddy of mine gave me that this last year, and so I'm moving some polymer in. I'm a huge fan of Night Runner Camellia. This is Camellia Williamsii. It's not the same or Japonica, it's different species all together. Camellia Williamsii. But anyway, be looking for some various things coming out of King's Nursery over the next uh, five to ten years uh, on, on stuff like this. We're excited about that. Flower and maple. It's just a fascination for some people. Again, doesn't love our winters or anything like that, but uh, and uh, needs some protection in the summer even. But uh, I, I do love those flowers and they really get people excited. Uh, old roses, the Atabalus rose, hard to beat that thing. Again, you gotta have some space. This is Sissinghurst, Bank, Lady Banks rose. All right, it goes up to be about 40 foot tall. And we can do that, you know? When we came back from England, all, everybody said, well, how do we do this or can we do can we do that and uh the answer was almost always no but with this the answer is yes we can do that so uh consider trying to find some place to put that up there melinda's dream one of my favorites not an antique but it sure acts like one dr basie down there one day i was uh out there doing a plant 
uh, sale for the uh, uh, Texas Indian Horticulture Club. And uh, this woman was uh, kind of, uh, she was playing along and I was having a good time. And so we were just uh, chatting back and forth. I said, man, you need a Belinda's primrose. She said, no, I don't. And I said, that's strange. Horticulture person, obviously she's here because she's excited about plants. Why wouldn't she want my Belinda's primrose? I said, you really need a Belinda's primrose. No, I don't. So my, I didn't think anything more, more about it. My department head comes out and said, I see you met Sissy. I said, yes, I did. I've been telling her she needs a Belinda's Green Rose. He said, no, she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> this was Belinda's mom. <laughs> and Dr. Basie, I just happened to choose the one woman uh, that didn't need a Belinda's Green Rose. Dr. Basie had done all the breeding on her property. So she had the original Belinda's Green Rose. <laughs> so she did not need one, but you do. Uh, Peggy Martin, of course, uh, one of the things that we're most proud of is that uh, there were two places where you could get Peggy Martin uh, directly after Dr. Welch got this thing sort of distributed around. One of those initial places was King's Nursery, and so uh, the, the genuine article right there on our property, Daddy was propagating those things and sent it a dollar every time he sold one back to the New World and started History Society. Peggy Martin's about to move, actually. She uh, can no longer really take care of the, the property that she had. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen to all that, but we're making sure that we have uh, as much off of her property as, as possible. But anyway, that's kind of fun. Y'all, right now, uh, huh. for Cynthia, uh, it's kind of hard to beat this thing. Uh, so, so that. Uh, I will say this one thing. I, I mentioned something about the, that I was going to talk about the soil. I'm a plant guy. I've always been a plant guy. I think I'll always be a plant guy. Uh, so it pains me to say this. But uh, I tell almost everybody, spend more money on your soil than you do on your plants. Uh, I'm not a soil guy. I don't love soil. It doesn't move me. Uh, but the plants are, are the soil that begin to move the plants. And therefore, if you'll spend more money on that, you'll do better with your plants that you buy from me. You'll feel better about coming to Tenham Hall. You'll feel better about the things that I say. And you'll say, you know what? I think we'll go back down there and we'll uh, help those folks out. Down there in Tenaha, we'll buy the little one some uh, Christmas presents or something, whatever. All right, look, we know it can be harder to choose. Uh, we talk about a lot of plants. You don't have an infinite amount of space. Not everybody has to choose, apparently. All right? But you do have to pick something. <laughs> At some point in time, you got to choose. Oh, I told me that I couldn't use this picture anymore. But she's not here. <laughs> so that's uh, more up to date thing. Y'all, uh, we're thrilled to have you, uh, uh, the chance to come talk to you today. Those are those students that I talked about. That's my sweet wife, myself, my son, and my mom. And those all other folks are folks that I had taught down at AM and they came in to help us out. So if you want to see us on Facebook or you want to see us on the web, whatever, you want to call us, you can still do that. You can email me there. But uh, thank y'all.